Ernstito, that's Hello in Cherokee. We're so excited to offer this adventure series geared for young people and engaging for all ages. I'm Julie Judkins. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach here with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And um, as most of us have done over the last six months, we've pivoted our regular education workshops for teachers and we've gone virtual. So this is the third of our virtual hike up the Appalachian Trail, starting in Georgia. Uh, we're now in Tennessee. Each, each of these series uh, features a host with an educator and a partner. The sessions are a resource for educators, for students, for young people, for parents, guardians, um, for really anyone interested in learning more about the topics that we have um, scheduled. We have um, what we think about as, I'll, I'll say a quote here, flowers bloom in the spaces between disciplines. Innovative, creative, sustainable solutions emerge from the spaces between the disciplines and not in the disciplines themselves. And we really think that way here on, on, about the AT. And it's a perfect platform and stage for this kind of learning. I'm gonna introduce, uh, you all to Botany and Blossom, our special speakers here in a minute, but first I just thought I'd give a little bit of um, logistical background on Zoom, because we are going to be Zooming. We're also Facebook Live. So um, just so everyone knows the chat feature, we will be using the chat feature. Highly encourage you to practice using it now. Tell me how you're feeling today. One is I'm pretty depressed. I wish I was in bed. Five is, I'm exuberant, this is amazing. I'm so glad to be here with all of you. <laughs> Good, thanks. So we'll have um, some presentation time. We'll have questions and discussion at the end and in the middle of the pre presentation. But be f feel free to share your thoughts and your questions in the chat as we go along through the presentation. And we'll capture questions for our presenters. And if we don't get to all the questions, we promise we'll follow up afterwards. Um, other things on Zoom that you can use are the reactions to clap for the presenters. Um, we also are going to have to keep you muted just to keep down on background noise. Um, and lastly, uh, we have a chance to win a, a Hydro Flask backpack at the end of the session. So if you stay tuned for the whole entire thing, we'll have a drawing and a, and a raffle. Uh, for those of you participating, if you are on Facebook Live, we'll need you to make a comment in the um, comment section so that we know that you're that you're with us to be considered for the giveaway. Uh, Chloe can has been showing you the the backpack there. So, um, a little bit of overview. Uh, many of you know about the Appalachian Trail, but it's a unit of our national park system and a hiking trail that goes through 14 states, starting in Georgia or in Maine, uh, going from one end to the other. It's built by volunteers, and it's taken care of by over 6,000 volunteers still today. Our organization, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, is a nonprofit that works with hundreds of partners like the National Park Service or National Forest Service and state agencies and all the volunteers to make sure it's an experience everyone can enjoy and learn from. We're so excited to have speakers through this adventure series to tell us more about the different aspects of the trail from hiking and recreation to plants and animals. So let's do, let's dive in. Um, I'm gonna, let's, uh, I'll, I'm gonna introduce our speakers. <laughs> Noah Nasseri and Kayla Carter. Uh, they're through hikers, they're formers, they're educators, they're bluegrass music and outdoor recreation experts. Um, Kayla, I first met Kayla by participation in our Next Gen Advisory Council. Um, they are actually going to go through and introduce themselves and their story in this really amazing way. So I'm not going to give you a whole lot um, here on them, and I'm going to just kick it over immediately to Kayla. Thank you, Julie, um, and thank you to all the presenters who um, have come before us. So we're really excited to share our passion for the VAT with everyone uh, during today's webinar. So a warm welcome to you all as you uh, enter the Tennessee section of 
the Appalachian Trail and of this uh, ad adventure series. Um, so hello everyone, I'm Kayla Carter. I am professionally um, the Outdoor Development Manager for the Northeast Tennessee Regional Economic Partnership. And I go by the trail name Blossom when I'm on the Appalachian Trail. And I'm Noah Nassery, biology teacher at Chucky Oak High School. And I go by the trail name Mr. Uh, and we're we're both Northeast Tennessee natives, um, and so um, natives, much like the plant that Noah is going to share with you all today. But um, first, let me tell you a little bit more about us, what we do, and where we live. Um, so this first photo, this first photo here, uh, was taken of a, uh, by one of our friends during our 2014 through hike. Um, it's on a very magical section of the AT, the Rhone Highlands. Um, and so uh, we really love that place. Um, so, um, so now you guys may know, may or may not know this, but the, uh, the Appalachian Trail follows the North Carolina Tennessee border for about 160 miles. So it's sometimes tough to tell whether you're officially in Northeast Tennessee or North Carolina. Um, but you make a clear break into Tennessee right where we live uh, and where our whole lives, uh, our whole lives. And so that's right here <laughs> uh, in Irwin, Tennessee, um, right outside the Nolichucky River. Um, and so we made the decision to uh, through hike the Appalachian Trail in 2014 after Noah graduated college uh, with a degree in biology and education. So one of our favorite pastimes when we were on the Appalachian Trail um, that brought us closer together was to identify the wildflowers. And that's pretty much how we earned our trail names, Botany and Blossom. Another activity that we really enjoyed um, doing together was stopping into the various trail towns. Um, we had this idea that we would find a community that we would call home along the Appalachian Trail, and we did that. Um, it just happened to be the same place that we've always grown up our whole lives. So um, I like to say that it's a different kind of trail magic uh, to have hiked thousands of miles and um, realize that your home is where you've been your whole life. Um, and so another kind of trail magic came to us when um, Mr. Botany over here proposed to me uh, on top of Katahdin when we completed our hike. So um, we're, we'll be getting married in a couple weeks on our farm. Um, where we plan to build a life together. Um, it's right outside of Johnson City, which you see here on your screen, where we, we marked our little house on there. <laughs> so um, we have a 32 acre farm with some forest land. So we'll be getting married there um, on the same day that we summited Katahdin six years ago. <laughs> um, so we're excited about that. Um, so together we made the choice to um, invest in the community in which we've known our whole lives. Um, so this is something that fuels me personally, but also professionally um, as I work for an economic development organization here. Um, there are so many uh, projects that we've launched. Um, so lucky to get to work for this organization because we've made it a priority to invest in outdoor recreation initiatives. Um, we partner with the Appalachian Trail. Um, we really love doing that, partnering with Julie and Chloe and Catherine. Um, so, hey guys. <laughs> and um, so I'm really proud of our Meet the Mountains Festival. So it's a, a fest, an annual festival where we invite children and their parents to come out and experience all things outdoors. Um, and so that's something we really like to do is better connect uh, families with the natural world. Um, and, and help people find things that are unique to, to us here in Northeast Tennessee. So i um, proud of what we've accomplished, but of course, none of that would really mean anything without awesome educators in our community like Mr. Botany, Noah here. Um, so the work that Noah does is really the front lines of change in our region. Um, we need our children, uh, hopefully some of you all out there, um, to be educated uh, about the natural world. So that's what um, Mr. Bonnie does. He helps students every day better understand and appreciate our environment on a much deeper level. And um, with that, I'm going to hand the mic and the presentation over to Mr. Botney to tell you all about the beautiful wildflowers and how to identify them.
Thanks, Kayla. Good job. <laughs> All right. So, guys, are you ready to learn? First, we have to set some goals, of course. Now, uh, I am a high school biology teacher, and I always like to outline our learning goals before we start the lesson. So, today, in today's lesson, we're going to be applying the scientific naming system, binomial nomenclature. We're going to evaluate ecological services that plants provide and how they help us as humans. We're going to use a dichotomous key to identify a plant. I'm gonna need your help with that one, so be ready to use the poll feature in a little while. And we're gonna play a game at the end to infer evolutionary relatedness based on the taxonomic classification of some organisms. So let's keep that in mind as we go forward. And our first plant is the beautiful painted trillium. I can see someone already freaking out about this amazing plant. It is, we, we're starting with that one because it is actually my favorite plant. It's an early spring plant. So um, it's, in the, it's in the trillium genus and there are 39 native trilliums in the US. This one is trillium undulatum and it's easily recognizable. So this is, this is something that you guys can go out and you'll see it on the side of the trail and you'll instantly know, bam, that's a trillium. And fun fact, it can live up to 25 years. So uh, they do take a long time to, uh, to reproduce and to spread, but they make up for it because they live a little bit longer. So uh, in the chat, uh, could you possibly shoot out some of your favorite plants? I think I probably know Catherine's favorite plant um, based on her reaction. But let's see what, oh, we got some moss lovers. Gotta love me some bryophytes. Lady slipper, hmm. Got some orchid fans out there as well. Ferns. All right. Pteridophytes. Love me some ferns. Some, some of the first vascular plants. Now, I will, I will put out a disclaimer. I, I am a high school biology teacher, <laughs> but I am not a botanist um, as a profession, so my knowledge is very limited, but I think we probably have some uh, folks in the audience that if we have any questions that I can't answer that they can kind of pitch in and help me out. So thanks for sharing guys. Let's move on to uh, our, our first learning goal, which is scientific names. So the need for scientific names arose due to the need to communicate across, communicate across language barriers and geographic zone. In one holler, they may call it, call it the pain in trillium. And in the next holler, they might call it the, uh, yeah, the pink middle trillium. Mm -hmm. So there was a need for a common naming system so that we know exactly what one and the other are talking about. And I think probably my Tennessee accent's coming through heavy uh, right now. Uh, for those of you that don't know, a holler is, is a sort of a, a crevice in the mountain. So um, excuse me for using that vocabulary. But so if we, if we break it down, binomial nomenclature, bi means two, nomial means name. So it's a two name naming system. The genus and the species are always italicized. So you can instantly recognize that when you're looking through like an article and the genus is always capitalized. Now we have a lot of adults in the audience that probably know this, but for our youngins, uh, just remember that the, it's italicized and the genus is capitalized. So, for example, this Fascolardus cineus would really love to have a donut right now. As you can tell, it's italics and the genus is capitalized. So it's in the genus Fascolartos. I probably butchered that. My Latin's not great. Another thing that you need to remember is 
that sometimes the genus is abbreviated with just the first letter. So an example is this U arctos versus arctos wants to grow up to be an American bullfrog. And you can see that the genus is abbreviated with a capital letter in the period. Another one you're probably more familiar with, hopefully you've never had this, but E. coli, the genus is just abbreviated. And our next specimen, it's not a fish, but it is a trout lily. <laughs> This one's another easily recognizable plant in the early spring. In fact, a lot of our plants on this uh, presentation are early spring plants. And they call them spring ephemerals. Um, they come out early and they leave pretty quickly. Um, the name of the yellow trout lily comes from the molting on the leaves, which resembles a trout, obviously. They grow in clusters. And uh, so in the, so spring ephemerals have a, a unique adaptation where, you know, they're coming out early. There's no leaves on the trees, so they get lots of sunlight, but it's still a little bit cold. And what we don't have a lot of in the early spring when it's cold are insects. So, you know, there's not that many pollinators around. But when they are pollinated, they tend to lean toward the ground and they have this interesting adaptation and I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, but it's basically dispersal of seeds by ants. And this is uh, really common amongst these uh, spring ephemerals. The trilliums uh, also have this adaptation, trout lilies and, and many others. But if you look here at the bottom, you can see this fatty deposit on the leaf. I believe this is a blood root seed actually, but you see this fatty deposit, that's a reward for the ant, a food source. And he's, or she is gonna take that back to the, uh, to the colony where they'll eat it. And the plant benefits from that by being deposited somewhere else in a really nice environment. Um, so the trout lilies, they really like, um, you know, the, the nice, rich, organic soils, and they don't really like disturbed areas as much. And the, along with a lot of other um, natives, they are threatened by some invasive species like garlic mustard, which actually secretes a um, mycotoxin, like a fungus killer. And that tends to kill the symbiotic fungus that, that helps the trout lily uh, survive. So we've, we've talked about binomial nomenclature and we've identified and looked at a couple of flowers. Now it's your turn. Right. So I'm going to need your help, but first we have to cover a few things about identification and, and leaf structure and root structure. So you're going to have two choices here, two. Simple leaves are with one leaf on a stem, and a compound leaf has many leaves on one stem. Okay, so that's going to come into play here in a minute. We have simple or compound. Some plants have palmate veins, which means they branch as much like our veins, and some have parallel veins. So there's two choices there. And for the roots, some have a straight thickened root and some have a J-shaped root that gets like that because of transplanting. Now, use the poll feature on Zoom to help me out here. Here's your first choice. Observe the plant on the left. I know it's kind of hard to see, but See if you can tell me, does this plant have simple leaves or compound leaves? So shoot me your answer in the chat. Do you think this plant has leaves or compound leaves? Simple, 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 simple. You guys, A plus, simple is correct. So now we move on to the second 
choice, which is, does this plant have palmate veins or parallel veins? Chat, what do you guys think? Parallel, parallel. I'm seeing lots of parallels. And again, class A plus, those are indeed parallel. And for the last question, look at the sketch. I know it's hard to see. I'm going to draw the root here. Does this have a straight rhizome or a J-shaped root? <laughs> It has a rhizome straight. That's right. I don't think anybody missed it. So you guys win the prize. You have correctly identified the dwarf crested iris, another one of our uh, favorite natives. And it's hard to tell from the picture, but the uh, dwarf crested iris, like the name says, is, is kind of short, not like your cultivated ones. A little more about dichotomous keys, though. That was one of our lear learning goals. If you'll notice, we had two choices each time, and that's where the word die comes from. And here's another example. For number one, you see that there are two choices, and it's either alternate or opposite. And so, you know, if it's alternate, well, bam, there you go. You know what it is. If it's opposite, you would move on to the next one. So, that is a dichotomous key. Here's one for spiders. One of my professors was an arachnologist, so I had to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Jones at ETSU. And so that's, you know, the old school way to identify. Um, most of us have these awesome pieces of technology in our pocket. So we can actually use some apps to help us identify. I noticed someone said they found a monar monarch on their uh, milkweed this morning. So um, I wonder if they used an, an app to identify that or uh, if they just knew, if they, were a, a lep if they knew their Lepidopteras. So let's move on y'all to the next specimen the dwarf crested iris. Thanks again for identifying that one for us. The dwarf crested iris, obviously in the iris family, iris cristata, it gets its name for the, uh, the crest in the yellow parts on the sepals, which serves to guide pollinators to the, the honey pot, to the reward down there. So, <laughs> it is a pretty purple. Yeah. Um, so these are another early spring um, plant. So you're going to look for these in the spring. And I know it's going to be tempting to dig them up and bring them to your garden, but uh, try not to do that, please. <laughs> Kayla's going to talk more about that later. So, you know, we're halfway through our, our hike on the AT section. Uh, excuse me, a Tennessee section of the AT. So if you have any questions or comments, throw them in the chat box. I'm going to take a swig of water. And thanks for your participation so far in the comments. I really appreciate that. And thanks to all of our viewers on Facebook Live. Appreciate you guys being on there. All right, so I think, I think we're ready to move on. We don't have any questions from the audience, so they must be ready for the next one, which is one of our fan favorites, the pink lady slipper. The rare and beautiful pink lady slipper is in the orchid family, and it actually doesn't flower every single year. Um, that's why it can be sometimes rare to find, but a lot of times when you do find lady slippers, whether it's a pink lady slipper or a yellow one, the, uh, you, you might find them in patches, but they, they really do require very specific 
growing conditions and soil conditions. As anybody who has a family member that's tried to grow orchids, they're, they're pretty finicky in particular about their growing conditions. And sometimes they won't grow for years and then they'll, or bloom for years and then they'll blossom and then, you know, the excitement, they freak out all, all about the orchids. So um, if you're an orchid fan, you'll know what I'm talking about. The, uh, the cool adaptation with the uh, pink lady slipper and kind of where it gets its name is that pouch. So the, the coloration and the sweet nectar smell will direct the pollinator into this entrance here. And the pollinator is sort of forced to go in through that and then up and out of the flower right here, which is where the reproductive parts of the flower are. And, you know, therefore it's, it's going to have a higher chance of being pollinated. You can tell when a pink lady slipper is pollinated from the, uh, you know, the swollen ovaries that's left um, after the, the blossom has wilted. And so if it's not pollinated, you won't really see that, that swollen ovary structure. And inside that ovary is, you know, million, well, lots, I don't know about millions, lots of little seeds. So those seeds are actually really tiny seeds and are wind dispersed. And so, you know, it's a lot of seeds, but it, again, it requires really specific conditions. And sometimes it can take years for it to flower for the first time. I read somewhere it was like seven years before they would flower in some cases. So our next specimen, one that's very special to us on the, on the Tennessee section of the AT is the Gray's Lily. What's so special about the Graves Lily, other than its beautiful, striking coloration and the uh, interesting shape of the flower, is that it's specific to our area. It likes the acidic soils of the uh, Appalachian Mountains and really likes the, the higher elevation open meadows, sometimes called balls. So this is the AT on James Bald in, uh, you know, near Roan Mountain. It's a really popular hike. If you haven't been there, it's, I'm pretty biased, but it's the best section on the AT. So uh, you really don't get this type of uh, plant community anywhere else in the South. Uh, you might get it in the Alpine areas of New England. But in the south, you don't get this open alpine mountaintop like you, like you normally would in, on the high mountains of New England. Clark, I totally agree with you on that. It's one of my, it's one of my favorite spots. Uh, does anyone else have a favorite place on the Appalachian Trail? <laughs> He's on the Facebook comments right now. <laughs> Max Patch. Max Hello. Patch, yep. That's a good place to fly kites, Max Patch. <laughs> Roan is spectacular, of course. Roan, Roan is, is super spectacular in the winter, actually. Um, and that may be one of the reasons the, uh, the balls are persisting even to this day is the, the extreme winds and, and harsh conditions in the winter. There was a um, botany project up there with goat, uh, yeah, sheep or goats? Yeah. It was sheep mm -hmm. um, to, to keep these bulbs cleared by, by, you know, grazing the vegetation down. And there have been efforts to keep the encroachment of the trees mm -hmm. off of the <laughs> yeah the encroachment of the trees off of the balds because it is it is a rare place so if you have a chance i highly recommend going to the roan highlands so this is what we call a, a species that is endemic and the word endemic just means it's only found in that place it's native and restricted to a specific place our next specimen here we go for those moss lovers. 
the maiden's hair moss. Now, I had I had to throw in a non -vas non vascular plant. Um, these early primitive plants uh, don't have a vascular system like the uh, you know the plants that we've been looking at, and so they need moist conditions. I mean, think about it: the the tree outside. How does it get the water from the roots to the tips of the branches? That's going to be through its veins, through its vascular system. So mosses aren't able to grow tall because of this lack of veins. And they need to be near, yeah, you guessed it. It needs to be near creeks, moist environments. And so the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee and North Carolina uh, is a perfect place for these types of, of plants because it is a rainforest after all. I know it's crazy, crazy to think about rainforest in Tennessee, what? But um, so it's a temperate rainforest, which means it does receive a lot of rainfall, um, but it has four seasons. So fun fact about the Fissidens, they can be used as a wound bandage uh, due to their antiseptic properties so kind of antibacterial uh, themselves. Our next specimen is, coming in slow, is a, a very ecologically important organism, the eastern hemlock. So what, so the eastern hemlock provides uh, what are called ecosystem services. So what is an ecosystem service? It is something that uh, a, a task that's being performed that benefits humans and benefits the ecosystem in many ways. So take a look at this picture here. This is the hemlock and this is it in its environment. Which ecosystem services do you think these native trees provide for humans and for the eco ecosystem? Give me an example, if you can. Explain, explain what, what do you think? We've got some options here. All the above? <laughs> yeah. Actually, you know, Jordan's, Jordan's cutting to the chase. <laughs> Erosion prevention, of course, in this picture, keeping the banks of the creek from being eroded. Rap trees are really important for that. Um, erosion prevention, where is it? There it is. Um, another thing is, of course, it's a plant, it's a tree, it's gonna store carbon. It's gonna, it's gonna take in carbon and turn it into to carbohydrates and store it in its tissues. It also is gonna help with water pollution, obviously, here next to the creek. It's going to provide habitat for uh, not only the terrestrial creatures, so the land creatures, but it also provides shade, actually, for the uh, creeks, which keeps the creeks cooler, and trout need that. They have to have those cool, well-oxygenated waters, so without those uh, hemlocks, our trout wouldn't thrive as well. Recreation and tourism. I had to put that one in there. And um, I mean, pretty much Jordan's right. We can circle all of these right here. Unfortunately, we will, if we lose the Eastern uh, Hemlock, we would lose the services it provides for us and for our ecosystems. And uh, it is actually threatened by some invasive species. I'll talk about that in a second. So why, why is the Eastern Hemlock so cool for me personally? Well, we live in the South, which is predominantly, you know, deciduous forest. So in this sea of green um, broadleaf trees, we get these little islands of conifers. And usually the, the, the major player in those communities is the Eastern Hemlock. So why, why is that the case? Well, it loves cool humid conditions. Uh, it loves to be at the tops of mountains and you know in the south it doesn't always get as cool 
So, um, you know, we don't, get, we don't get these types of forests that often. It's actually the last in ecological succession. So after a, a fire or a human caused disturbance wipes out the community, it's, it's gonna be the last to grow back after the grasses, the shrubs. Finally, you know, like 7,500 years later, you'll get those hemlocks coming in. Uh, so the uh, old growth project actually documents these, these trees and you find some of the biggest specimens. Ants is the, shoot, I can't remember the acronym. Basically, they, they survey trees. Um, I'll have to see if I have my source. No, sorry, that was a question from, uh, from one of the Facebook libbers. Um, so the, the old growth project documented these trees and <laughs> sorry, Kayla found something about ants, um, but, <laughs> it, but it was on Lord of the Rings. Uh, so <laughs> tree beard, <laughs> that's an ant. <laughs> um, so some of the largest, uh, trees in these old growth forests are eastern hemlocks and um, one of the oldest, I, I, I believe this tree m may have been declining recently, but Chiloa is one of the, the biggest trees, um, biggest hemlock trees and it's found in our area here near the Smoky Mountains. So they are being threatened by invasive species. Why, why are invasive species such a hot topic um, for our natives? Well, they, they are prolific because they don't have any natural predators. They are generalists, so they can occupy a wide variety of, niche, of niches. niches. Uh, they reproduce very quickly and they outcompete our natives for resources, for space, for uh, sunlight, for food, for, for those types of things. So this is the um, web, the, the sack of the woolly adelgid, and it actually lives in here, and you can't see it, it's very small. It lives in those sacks and um, sucks the, uh, the sap from, from the tree, which causes it to die. Some other examples of invasive species are, you probably heard the Burmese python, um, problem in Florida. Um, everybody's seen stink bugs around here. Um, and if you've ever driven on the side of the road, you know what kudzu is. So those are just a few more examples of invasive species problems. Eastern Native Trees Society. Ant stands for Eastern Native Trees Society. I'm not going to write that out. It's going to take too long. <laughs> All right, so are you guys ready? Who's related? We're going to play a game called Who's Related? So tell me, audience, you have option one, option two, option three. Which of these two or which two of these three are most closely related? Is it A and B? Is it B and C? Or is it A and C? We got some answers coming in. Some people are saying option Oh, this is A and C. A and C. Some people say an option B and C. So not too many people say an A and B. So that's probably not one of our options. We got A and C and B and C. All right. So we're going to go to the next slide. And let's see if you can tell me who's most closely related based on the taxonomic classification. Send me another answer in. If it changed. <laughs> if it changed. I'm B and C. 
B again. And so actually B and C are correct. So if you left, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say B and C. A and C is correct. So if you look at the taxonomic breakdown, they're all in the plant kingdom. They're all tracheophytes. They're all, they are all flowering plants, angiosperms. And so all the way down to the order, which is different, and the two that are common are A, that's the correct answer, A and C. Cool. Sorry, B is not related. I messed up. So um, if you chose B and C, you probably did so based on morphological characteristics, the, the, the visual structure of the plant. And that is understandable because these next two specimen have a shared characteristic, although they're not from the same evolutionary origins, they do share the same adaptation. This is the beautiful ghost pipe. Monotropa uniflora is actually in the heath family, which is more closely related to the rhododendrons than the bear corn. So why is it white? Well, it actually lacks chlorophyll and it does not photosynthesize. So Mr. Botany, it doesn't photosynthesize. How does it get its food then? Well, it is a myco heterotroph. What that means is it saps uh, sugars from a fungus that lives in the roots of trees. So it's kind of a long line of, of relationships, symbiotic relationships, but first the sun's rays come down on the pine tree typically. The pine tree is going to convert that into chemical energy, so sugar. And the sugar then goes to a, a mycorrhizal fungus, usually from this family. And then the ghost pipe finally will get some of those sugars from the fungus. Fun fact about the ghost pipe, the ghost pipe can be used or has been used for, um, and still to this day by some people, for, uh, it's a, as a mild painkiller. And our last specimen, another mycoheterotroph, the bear corn. It gets its name from its shape, and obviously it looks like corn. And I have seen some sources say that bears do eat it. Um, I heard it's high in fiber, so if we want to stay regular, then have at it. But uh, the, the bear corn is in the broom rape family and is more associated with oak trees. And again, it's lacking chlorophyll because of this special relationship. It has, it's a mycoheterotroph. It doesn't have a, a fragrance or a nectar reward for its pollinator because it is really good at self-pollinating. All right, so that is the end of my portion of the presentation. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and playing along with our games. Looking at the chat, looks like we got a question about dicots and the word dicot, actually di means two, dot is referring to cotyledon. So what that means is when it comes up out of the ground, as a young seedling, it has two cotyledons. It has two first leaves. One example would be like a pea. It has two uh, parts of the seed. A corn would be a monocot. It has one, uh, one cotyledon that comes out of the seed. Hope that answers your question, Jordan. All right. Thank you, Noah. That um, quite impressive stuff. Um, I've learned a lot today. Um, so.
Um, the last topic that I really wanted to end on uh, with you guys today is about stewardship and volunteerism. Um, and so when I say stewardship, what I really mean is, you know, giving back or volunteering. Um, after all, we are representing the volunteer state of Tennessee today. So um, I couldn't leave you guys without mentioning this. Um, so there are really, there are many ways to get involved in giving back to not only the Appalachian Trail, um, but to communities um, in which you guys want to see grow um, and you want to see yourselves grow within. So um, you'll see here a photo of me um, during Sweat Crew, which is an awesome program that you can get involved in through the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. Um, you can go out and backpack for several days in the Smokies and um, do some trail work. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that. Um, and then on the left side of the screen here are some of my friends that I've met or gotten involved in um, giving back through the Tennessee Eastman Hiking and Canoeing Club, which is the trail maintaining club here in Northeast Tennessee. Um, so I'm proud to be a member of that. And um, I've just really enjoyed sharing this with people um, and I'm excited to share um, with you guys. And so, um, you know, maintaining the trail is just one way that I give back. I have a three mile section of the Appalachian Trail here that I maintain. Um, and then another thing that I really love to do is um, teach Leave No Trace. Um, so I'm a master educator, Leave No Trace. And I believe we have several other um, folks call today too that are master educators or trainers. So um, let, let us know in the, in the comments if you guys um, have heard about Leave No Trace or if you guys teach Leave No Trace too. So I'm hoping that this won't be redundant, but I did wanna show you guys um, some hand signals that will help you remember all seven principles of Leave No Trace. Um, and so I think what we're gonna do is um, stop sharing the screen so you guys can see me and then we'll, we'll share the presentation again um, in just a minute, but hopefully you guys can see me. So follow along with me, I can see some of you guys. So um, this will be fun. So hold your hand up and make a little stage. <laughs> Um, and then you're going to, you're going to start with number one. So number one on your little stage and the movement that you want to do is to hold it up to your temple. And so this is no before you go. Really important principle. Um, plan ahead and prepare is another way to remember that. So number one, no before you go. Um, back on your little stage, number two, we're going to travel and camp on durable surfaces. So this is a little guy just walking across the stage. Um, I think uh, it's important to talk about this one. You guys are doing great. Um, to talk about this one in terms of what Botany was talking about, um, you know, we don't want to camp on or trample on any native plants that are out there. We want people who come after us to be able to experience them too. So number three, um, we're going to bring our, little, our fingers together and then we're going to make a little shovel and we're going to dig in to our hand. <laughs> so this is, um, this is our disposing of waste properly principle. And so that can be human waste or just um, trash that we've, um, you know, we've eaten something. And um, so we need to make sure that we are disposing of that waste properly. Everything we bring into the backcountry, we need to bring out. And then number four, um, same concept. So fingers come together and just, it's a little bit of a stretch, but it's leaf. So this is a little leaf floating down to your stage. Uh, it's leaf what you find, which, just stands for leave what you find. <laughs> so um, going back to what Botany was talking about, um, if you find an awesome plant, it might be your first reaction to go and, and pick it and take it to someone that you really care about. But what we wanna do is we wanna leave it there um, so that others can experience it too. And then number five, um, so take your hand and make a little cup and then just wiggle your fingers. So this is a fire. So this helps us remember to uh, minimize campfire impacts. Um, so, you know, wildfires, um, uh, just if we don't need a fire necessarily for survival, um, there are other ways that we can get around having a, having a light at a campsite. And then number six, you don't have a stage anymore. Um, you're just gonna hold up both of your fingers with three. Yeah, you guys, you guys look great. Okay, and then this is, yeah, a little antler. So we're, we're moose now. So this uh, is Respect Wildlife. <laughs> I like, thanks Chloe, that was, that was really great. Um, so this is res be, uh, be respectful of wildlife. So, um, you know, don't get in their space. Um, let them be from a distance. Um, don't feed them. That's another important part of that principle. And then the last one is 
um, a peace sign and a wave. So this is seven. So this is just be considerate of others. So you're going to wish people peace as you pass them and wave and be friendly. Um, so um, that's all seven principles. Now I want to play just another last quick game with you guys. I um, want to play what we call a the ethics game and it'll be really quick. So we've got um, four things on the screen here, some little scenarios and I've got three of the principles lifted, uh, listed on the left side. And so what I want you guys to do is read the first one, the trash on the ground uh, in the classroom uh, and around camp. And let me know in the comments um, which principle you think this applies to. All right, we've got three. number three, number three. Okay. Yeah, good job, guys. <laughs> Spot on. Um, kids or adults picking wildflowers, which Mr. Botany would not approve of. <laughs> um, what do you think? Four? You're saying four? Four. That's correct. Right, you are. Good Thanks, job. guys. Good participation. So um, people breaking off the branches on trees, which I suspect could apply for number, um, what was it? Number five? Fire. Minimizing campfire. They're probably doing this for some firewood, but um, they're saying four. They're saying four. Let's see. Yeah, leave what you find. Let's leave those branches alone. Um, so trampled flowers around an air, uh, outdoor area or camp on a trail. Number two. two. That's what they're saying. All right, you guys are smart. You guys, you guys <laughs> pick this up quick. So you guys are already leave no leave no trace experts. So thank you guys so much. Um, so uh, we're gonna leave you with this picture of us uh, on our through hike. Um, we were excited to be leaving Tennessee and heading into Virginia, which I think is your all's next stop. Um, so if you guys have any questions or um, comments, uh, let us know and we'll hand things back over to Julie. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Botany and Blossom for taking us on that adventure. Does anyone have any final questions for our speakers? Um, and I just want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, thank you for your time and giving us all this great presentation material today. Join us for our next adventure in two weeks where we will talk about wellness and have two amazing speakers from Virginia. Um, I believe that's on September 16th at 4 p.m. Thanks, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>